thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here. I've seen your virtual stage. I think that's very unique. So, you know, kudos to that. That's very well done. <laughs> it's a very, uh, it brings up, you know, brings back those feelings when I was on stage and actually talking to people. So it's, it's just good to see that, you know, we're um, uh, at least in a vir virtual world, we have a, uh, a live stage. Okay, so let's talk about WebAssembly and, and JavaScript, right? So I, I got a very good introduction, so I'm just going to skip my, my second slide. In fact, I'm going to click play so that you can see this in, in full screen. Uh, one thing that I will say is actually two things. If you are going to be interested in, you know, becoming a Google developer expert, then, you know, feel free to talk to me and I can walk you through that process. So if you're interested in that, it's, it's very easy. Um, and, you know, I, I do encourage you that you join that program. And also, if you have any questions about, you know, my talk about, as I said, the GD program or WebAssembly or anything else that I happen to talk about, uh, you can reach me on Twitter. So you see my Twitter handle under the, the photo here, so that's DPIRS. Uh, my DMs are open, so feel free to ask away, and I'll be more than happy to uh, answer any sort of questions that you have. Okay, so before we start, I have a joke for you, which, you know, since we're going to talk about WebAssembly, I thought I would ask you this question. Uh, do you know why assembly programmers are always soaking wet? Well, if you didn't know, it's because they work below the sea level. Okay, I, I don't know if people are like face palming or laughing, but hopefully some of you did get this joke. Right, so on a more serious note, let's talk about, you know, uh, how the web looked like in 2018 and, and of course before. So back in the day, the browser had two sort of distinctive uh, execution engines, right? It had a virtual machine which was able to execute JavaScript code, which is the JavaScript that you write, you know, that's ES5, that's ES6, and it also had access to the web APIs. Okay, so this is how the web used to look like. You could write JavaScript code, the browser was able to execute the JavaScript code, and then the browser used to uh, or still understands your web APIs. Okay, so it was simple. There's two things, virtual machine, JavaScript execution, and the understanding of web APIs. Um, but as it happens, the web is changing. It's progressing at an incredible pace, right? There are new frameworks, there are new ways to create web apps. Now you can create web applications that work offline, that send you notifications, that can access Bluetooth devices. So the web ecosystem has become incredibly large and the main language that we're using on the web is JavaScript, of course, right? We started as a very tiny scripting language, which was created in like two weeks. And then now, you know, even at banks or, or very serious systems, we are running JavaScript. But JavaScript has certain limitations, and that is due to the nature of, you know, it was just a scripting language created to sort of accomplish HTML, right? So now JavaScript is, needs to do a lot of processing, but it has certain uh, limits due to its original intentions or, or, you know, why it was created in the first place. So it's very difficult to achieve low level tasks in JavaScript without creating a performance impact, right? So I'm not saying that you can't do low level tasks because you can do some low level tasks but that is going to potentially cause you some performance impact. So, you know, you're going to slow down your application or you're going to end up having a larger bundle sizes that you, that you want to. And that's going to also increase what they call this download parse compile cycle, right? So downloading and parsing and compiling your JavaScript, if it's a large file, it's going to take more time. And then if you have some low level uh, tasks within your JavaScript file, it is also going to cause a performance impact um, on your application. So in order to sort of circumvent the, the shortcomings of JavaScript, this language was created that is called the WebAssembly. And the WebAssembly was created in 2015, so only five years ago. But I have an asterisk on this slide because we need to also mention ASMJS. Okay, so ASMJS predates WebAssembly by two years and it was you know, created, I think, by the folks at Mozilla um, in, in 2013, which basically allowed developers to take applications that they were having in C or that they originally wrote in C 
and then run those applications as web applications. So run, you know, applications written in C on the web, essentially. So that's ASM.js. And that is also sort of the foundation of, of WebAssembly as we know it today. And what's great about WebAssembly is that, you know, people were talking about it for quite a few years now. But as of 2019 and, and December of 2019, so end of last year, WebAssembly became a W3C recommendation. So it is an official thing, right? So WebAssembly is now official. There's, you know, a spec for it. People are, are updating that spec. People are actually working on the spec and they are bringing additions to WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is, you know, officially part of the web, so to speak. Now, what is WebAssembly? So I, I have this explanation. I think I took it from, from Mozilla's website. So they say that WebAssembly is a low level assembly like language with a compact binary format that runs with near native performance and provides languages such as C, C++ and Rust with a compilation target so that they can run on the web. I think this is a mouthful. OK, this is a very good description, but I came up with my own, which is basically WebAssembly allows you to run native apps on the web. OK, simple as. Um, of course, there are additional things that we need to mention from the previous code, right? So you can run your applications that are written in C, C++ and a myriad of other languages on the web at a near native performance speed. OK, so you're not going to get a penalty for trying to run a C++ application, for example, uh, on the web. It's going to work really fast. And what's really interesting about this as well, and this is also trying to debunk some of the myths around WebAssembly, is that WebAssembly functions, so basically functions that you create in, let's say, C++, can be exposed and called inside JavaScript. So I can have a C++ function in a C++ file. I can generate WebAssembly from that C++ and I can tie that in with my JavaScript and I can just call that function just as I would call any other JavaScript function in my web app. OK, now there were lots of rumors a couple of you know, years ago, and I don't know how many of you heard this or, or maybe you've seen some tweets about this. People were saying that, oh, WebAssembly is the new thing. You know, JavaScript is going to go away. Uh, you know, JavaScript is not going to be used. The reign of JavaScript is over, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that is, it couldn't be further away from the truth because WebAssembly is not going to replace JavaScript. It's it's going to enhance and augment it. It's going to make it better. It's you know, it's going to allow JavaScript to go one level deeper into into native performance and achieve very very low level tasks. Okay, so in you know after this talk, if if you hear that people are saying, oh, you know, I heard about WebAssembly and it's going to get rid of JavaScript, you can very safely correct them and righteously correct them and tell them, no, JavaScript is here to stay. WebAssembly is going to make JavaScript much better. Okay. So the web platform, you know, we had to look at how it, it used to look like in 2018 and before, but how does it look like today? So today inside the browsers, and, and when I say inside the browsers, I say in, you know, what they collectively refer to as the, the modern browsers. So, you know, the latest couple of versions of Chrome, Safari, Firefox, etc. You still have the web APIs, right? You get access to the standard web APIs, you know, these will be the Fetch API and some others. Um, there are, of course, more web APIs that are available for browsers today than two years ago. But let's take a look at on the left hand side. Let's take a look at the virtual machine side. So we, we established that, you know, browsers can execute JavaScript code, but in the latest version of the web browsers, and also because WebAssembly is now an official thing, the virtual machine that you find inside the web browsers can now also execute WebAssembly code. OK, so you can execute your WebAssembly code in all modern browsers. So not just JavaScript, but WebAssembly as well, on top of, of course, the web APIs. So WebAssembly itself actually comes with a JavaScript API, which allows you to load WebAssembly modules into your web application. It also allows you to manage memory and some table instances. Um, and then you also have this thing, which is an instance of a WebAssembly, which is basically the, the WebAssembly module, its memory consumption put together, 
And you can think of this instance um, just as if you would think about an ES 2050 module, which means that inside your JavaScript application, you can import an actual WebAssembly instance and you can access its methods and you can call those methods, which as I said, under the hood is going to then call the C or the C++ or the Rust uh, methods that you have defined in your application. So how do you create WebAssembly files? And WebAssembly files, that's why I write it here in the title, have uh, an extension of WASM, so that's W-A-S-M, so that's WebAssembly module. And basically you, you have two options, actually you have three options. So, you know, option one is that you use a, a language of C or C++ or any other LLVM supported language. So LLVM is low level virtual machine, which is basically a compiler infrastructure, okay? Um, just think of it as a set of compilers and tool chains. So it's not only C and C++ that is LLVM supported, but things like C Sharp, Haskell, Objective-C and, and some other languages. So you can either write some code in these languages or you can take an application that you, you found the web, on the web or you, you, know, you, you wrote it 10 years ago and you can, with the uh, usage of this thing called mscripten, create a, and produce a web assembly file. Okay, so mscripten is a common line tool where you just specify where's your C++ file, you know, where, where that's located. There's a myriad of options that you can specify and then you say, the uh, compilation targets should be a WebAssembly module or a WASM file. And then, you know, if everything goes according to plan, you just type in this mscript and uh, CLI command, and then the, after the entire compilation, you get a WebAssembly file or a WebAssembly uh, module created for you, which you can then take and load and consume inside your JavaScript context. So you can take that WebAssembly file, load it, you know, via JavaScript, access its methods, and, and um, just call them. Now, in, in recent years, um, there are some other languages that you can, that they started to support WebAssembly, uh, purely because, you know, they also realized that the, the power of WebAssembly, that it's, it's, you know, a really great addition to the web. So if you write uh, your application or you have some code written in any of the .NET languages or Java or Ruby or Go, these can also compile to WebAssembly. So you can also specify a compilation target to, to WebAssembly for these languages. And the process is going to be the same. Once you have that WebAssembly module, that WASM file, you can just load it and consume it inside your Java, inside JavaScript, inside your, your web application. And the list doesn't stop here because, as I said, due to the recent popularity of WebAssembly, a lot of languages added WebAssembly as a compilation target. So C, C++, C Sharp, we already established that, but there's also D, F Sharp, Go, Java, PHP, Python. And as of, I think, a couple of months ago, which was very interesting to me, is TypeScript. So you can write some low-level TypeScript code, and then you can produce a WebAssembly module from TypeScript, okay? which is, I think, very, very interesting. Um, there's this uh, person, um, AppCypher, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the, the person's name, but uh, th this particular individual has collected, uh, basically has this very nice table of all these languages that compile to WebAssembly, and on that, in, inside that table, you can see whether the WebAssembly uh, support is full or in progress or partial. Okay, so you, you, know, you go to that list, you take a look at the language that you're familiar with, and then you, you can check whether that particular language compiles to WebAssembly and what's the status of that, whether that's you know, uh, fully functional and you can use that or whether it has some shortcomings and then it's going to be uh, listed there. So that's a very, very good resource in my opinion. Okay, let's take a look at a few demos and I'm going to switch over to my code editor. And I'm going to start with, with a very, very basic example. OK, so let's start with a C example and don't worry, this is going to get more complicated. OK, I'm, I'm just going to you know, sort of ease you into into uh, WebAssembly now. So what I have here is a file called square.c, which is a, a, a C file, and I have an int square method in here, which takes an integer and of course returns the integer multiplied by itself, meaning we square the number. OK, so this is a very, very simple C file 
And what I've done, I executed this command. This is mscripten, okay? EMCC is mscripten, which is a command line tool that I mentioned. And basically the, the, the key bits here are, you know, run the mscripten command line tool, take square.c, so take this file that I'm using, create a WebAssembly module for me, and create a JavaScript executable as well in square.js. Okay, so I type this command in and I got this square the JavaScript file, which is, as you can see, a, a JavaScript module essentially. But this file is auto generated for me using that EMCC. I, I, I'm not even going to tell you what's in this, right? It's just, you know, all sorts of WebAssembly stuff. But essentially, you know, I talked about the WebAssembly table, I talked about the WebAssembly module, and, and all these basically WebAssembly JavaScript API elements are in this JavaScript file and it is automatically generated for me. I don't need to worry about any of this, right? So mscripten generated this for me automatically. So what I can do then is inside HTML, actually, let me open this uh, so that we can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so localhost 8080, 8080. Let's put this here. Zoom in and let's put that there. Okay, so I have two examples. So we're talking about the C++ example, right? So I load this and what I have here is an input uh, field with a button that has an ID of calculate. Inside my HTML, I load the JavaScript that mscripten has generated for me, which is square.js. And I can then utilize again the WebAssembly JavaScript API to load my C++ file and I'm loading the in square method and, and with the CREP method I specify basically the, the name of the method that I want to load the um, and I always mix these up I, I can't remember if this is the parent the type of the parameter that it expects and what it returns or the other way around right so here I'm expecting an integer and I do return an integer. Okay, so I, I don't know which order it is, but you specify the argument type and the return type. Then I'm writing standard JavaScript, right? So I get element by ID on the calculate button. I then add an event listener for the click event on the button. You know, I get the number. And what I do is I call this calculate square method and you know, I just called it calculate square in here. I could have called it whatever else. And I pass in the input number. So I pass in the number that I have. And the result is going to be that the underlying C++ code is going to be called. And then I get the re result of that return to me. OK, so this four comes back from the, uh, the mathematical calculation found in my C program. OK. So this is going to just square these numbers. Now, probably you're thinking, why is this low level and why am I looking at this? As I said, I'm just going to ease you into WebAssembly, but this is just the simplest example that I can show you how you can invoke something in JavaScript via the, uh, the WebAssembly JavaScript API, which in turn is then going to call, you know, your in square method in C. Now, I think I lost, yeah, now you can hear me, hopefully. Sorry, I lost audio for a second. So just to reiterate, we're not going to, go back. we're not going to call effectively this method in C. What this is calling is the, the calculate method that I have inside this square JS file, right? Which is the file that got generated using mscript. Now I have another example for you. So this is C, which is, you know, uh, an NLVM supported language. But I said that you can also create um, WebAssembly using other languages. So here's another example, which is, a, you know, written in Go. So I created this very small application that instead of squaring the numbers, it's going to cube the numbers. OK, now the difference between LLVM based languages and for example Go is the fact that Go is sort of two way. So Go can access variables 
from your JavaScript file as well. So this is a Go file and notice how I can do document get element by ID result and then set the inner HTML of the element here from a Go context. OK, so I have basically the functionality here in Go. I have, you know, number times number times number, which is essentially cubing the number that comes in. And I created this, you know, WebAssembly module by running this command here. OK, so I specified the, uh, the architecture to be WebAssembly and I told Go to create a cube.wasm file, which in fact, uh, it did. Oh, and, and what I forgot to show you, I'm so sorry. I did not only create square.js, I also created square.wasm uh, with mscript and of course, right? I created the wasm file. I'm sorry, I, I forgot to mention that. But for uh, for the Q, for the Go version, again, I have the cube.webassembly file. And when it comes to Go, they also give you this webassembly exec.js file which is going to be this large JavaScript file, which again, if we load into HTML, we will be able to load the, the WebAssembly module generated via Go. Okay, so if I open that example, which is right here, I bring in the WebAssembly executable. So let's go to that Go example now. So I bring in that executable and I say, okay, if you know the browser does not support this, then, you know, initiate streaming, load my uh, WebAssembly module and, uh, sorry, it's here, uh, load my WebAssembly module via the Fetch API, access the module, access the instance, and just execute the instance itself. Okay, so basically start up my Go program within the context of my web app, and then what I do on clicking the button, I can directly just access Cube which was the method or the, the function that I specified in here. Okay, so th this works slightly differently than, than the C++ example, because now even from HTML, once my module is loaded, I can just directly access the name of the function that I created inside uh, Go. And what I can do now, I can say three, calculate 27, right? So I'm cubing these numbers. Right, so hopefully you get the idea. Um, and, and now, again, as I said, you're thinking, okay, this is no nothing low level. You can, you know, square and cube numbers in JavaScript just as easily, which is true. But let me show you yet another example, which is not this one, but this one. And what I'm going to do is just bear with me for one sec. Yep, I can do Python 3 server.pi. Uh, and if you're wondering what is this server, it's just going to serve up this index file for me. Okay, so it's just an HTTP service. It has nothing to do with, with WebAssembly. So let's go to 8998. Okay, here we go. Right, so th this is an application that I wrote. Um, uh, and there's a background story for this, right? So I work for this company called uh, Cloudinary. So let, let me show you an, an example, right? So Cloudinary allows you to upload images and, and uh, videos to, to the cloud. And then what we can do, we can optimize these images and, and videos when you deliver them to your web app. And one of our features, uh, let me just zoom in here. And one of our features is the fact that if I put F auto, and I'm not sure how visible this is, I can try to zoom in maybe. If you put F underscore auto as part of your delivery URL, then based on the browser that you're using, we are going to send the appropriate, the most, appro pro most appropriate image format for the browser. So even though this is a JPEG image, if I put F auto to it, notice that inside Chrome, it delivers a WebP image because for Google Chrome, WebP is the most optimal image format. If I, you know, maybe shrink down this image using the width parameter, which is like width underscore 500, then let's take a look. Um, okay, no, it's here. I still get a WebP, but what if I add like Q underscore auto? So basically I can manipulate this image to have automatic quality uh, and other things. 
and it keep and will keep on reducing the size of the image, but still delivering me a WebP and not you know any other format. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be nice if I could go one level deeper and further analyze the image that Cloudinary is sending to my browser? So I want to see not only it's you know whether it's a WebP or whether it's a PNG, but I would love to see which kind of PNG it is. Is it PNG you know eight, PNG thirty two, or is it you know WebP and what kind of container the WebP has? So again, you know low level image processing that I can't do with the JavaScript today. And in fact, I managed to do that. So this particular application allows you to add a cloud in the URL to it. OK, for example, you know, black car F auto select a user agent. So this is now a uh, Chrome. And if I hit the check button, it's going to go back and say, OK, this is a JPEG. This is the size. The quality of the JPEG is around 88. Now what I can do, I can change the user agent and FYI, there's no way that you can programmatically choose uh, change the user agent, but you can cheat and you can use the network conditions panel in Chrome and instead of saying select automatically, you can say I want to have a Safari Mac user agent. And as you can see, my application looks at that. And now what's going to happen, I'm going to request this cloudinary image, the same URL, but by faking my browser to be a Safari browser and see what happens if I do check. Now, because Safari understands the JPEG 2000 image format, it is actually sending that image file back for me and I can still get some very interesting details. What if I now change the width of this image to be 500, so I will shrink it down and do a check. So now Safari sends a JPEG back. But what if I now go back and say, yeah, I'm on a Chrome. OK, so now I'm on Chrome. Now I get WebP, which we established that, you know, for Chrome, that's the most appropriate image format. But I can tell you that this is a VP8 type of WebP, which is lossy and it does not have an alpha channel. OK, I could change this to jamstack.vader.png, hit check. OK, so that's a, a PNG image. OK, and it's actually PNG 32 with a bit depth of A, true color with alpha, and it doesn't have any interlacing. And what if now I say, OK, you know what? I want to be a Firefox on, on, on a Mac. So changing the user agent, do a check. OK, that's PNG 32 again, but what if I add F underscore auto, so automatic format to my URL? OK, so now, no, no, not Safari, sorry, a Firefox actually loads a WebP, which is a VP8X, which is a lossy one, and it does have an author channel. OK, so the point being here is that now I go one level deeper, and I actually utilize Go to create my WebAssembly, and I have you know one Go file to make the image request. And let's take a look at the PNG one. So I can access the the buffer of the uh, PNG files, and I can essentially run you know low level checks against the PNG image. And I can do the same for the WebP image. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, I am also loading the you know the vp8 the vp8l container stuff i you know i can access the metadata for those images i can extract all sorts of information from the web image and just build up that response somewhere here no it's not in here i'm sorry it's here uh, i can build up all my responses and this is in fact what you see inside the web application. OK, so hopefully now you see how you can go one level deeper. And then the last example before I wrap up that I want to show you. Is actually uh, I spent a lot of time on this. <laughs> like I mean a lot of time, like weeks. Um, uh, what am I doing? I need to open Python 3 server.py. Um, so again, at Cloudinary, one of my colleagues created this C++ application a couple of years ago. Uh, um, 
so so Yon uh, created this you know back in in 2017, which he called simulacra with, with double S in the beginning, right? So structural similarity similarity unveiling local and compression related artifacts. That's the name of the, the product. Essentially, what it does, you give it two pictures, and it's going to tell you based on some uh, analytical processing by C++ and based on data fed into it uh, after user research, how similar those images are, um, so how, how similar the two images are. But, but you have to remember that we're talking about the same image. So if you reduce the quality of image one, you can tell how close that image is to the original image with regards to quality. OK, so it's a very, very interesting tool written you know, 100% in C++ and it was intended to use to be used only on the CLI, you know, in, in uh, Linux and, and some other operating systems. I, I don't know if he has like instructions in here, but basically you would type in. Where can I type here? You would type in Simulacra, you know, once you created the, the actual binary from it and you put image one.jpg, for example, and image two uh, JPEG like so okay and then it would give you a score like zero would be exactly the same images 0 0.002 still very similar images the closer the number is to one so 0 0.8 would be very different uh, quality images for the same image and then i thought this would be perfect what, what you know why couldn't i make this into a web application right and that's what i did so i took this entire c++ file I had to, you know, make some teeny tiny changes in it. I ran it through uh, mscripten, which was the emcc CLI command. That generated this JavaScript file for me. It generated the WebAssembly file for me. And now the result is that inside my browser, I can run image similarity for two images. Okay, so let's let's do a test. I have, you know, image number one, image number two, calculate the similarity. And since these are exactly the same images, similarity is zero, meaning that they are exactly the same. Now, what if I put Q auto, and I didn't tell you that, but Q auto is basically a flag at, in Cloudinary that reduces the quality of this image automatically based on various algorithms in a way that is not affecting the human eye, but it's going to remove a lot of kilobytes. And then, you know, we can we can test that uh, really uh, easily here. So I open the network panel. I paste this in. So you will see that this is an image of a car and this image is. Uh, sorry, it's here. Uh, 1.4 megabytes. OK, and if I do Q auto add it to it then it's only 730 C, uh, 737 kilobytes. But the quality seemingly is still, you know, it is a beautiful image. There's, there's nothing, nothing has changed. Also, I want to show you if I put Q underscore one, it's going to generate, you know, quality one. And you can see this is now an ugly image and it is 25 kilobytes in size, of course. So this tool, is now going to tell us whether the automatic quality reduction by Cloudinary and the original image, you know, whether it's it's the same or, you know, so now we get 0 0.03, which means we are very far away from one. So the automatic tool has deduced that this is a good quality reduction. If I put quality underscore one, then you will see that this number is going to go to 0 0.4, meaning that these images are now you know, significantly uh, different. And of course, you know, if, if we pick a, 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 any other image, you know, you can put any image in here, not just cloud images, and you can put in the same image uh, reduced uh, with a reduced quality in here, calculate the similarity, and then you will see whether, uh, you know, what sort of number you get. But this is only possible because I managed to port that C++ application into WebAssembly and now I'm calling that here behind the scenes. OK, and calling it is very similar to what I've shown you with squaring the number. OK, so I have an email listener for the click button. Um, 
uh, and then I just call the calculate method and then I call the simulacra score calculation method in here. One very interesting thing here, and this is super interesting and I was really pleased with this, is that I can actually read the, the, the image URL and I can actually save it as uh, any file inside the virtual machine that the browser uses to execute WebAssembly. So you can see that I'm using write file to write this file to WebAssembly. Okay, so WebAssembly has its own little storage space and you can actually write files to it. So what I do, I take these two images from, uh, from, the, from the application, I write them inside the WebAssembly uh, compiler and then I use those two images to run the calculation locally, and then I pass the calculation back using the simulacra. Okay, so you can do amazing things here. Um, as you saw, you know, just porting something in C++ is, uh, is possible, and you can do really low-level calculations um, with that. So I think I'm, I'm kind of running out of my time, so let me uh, wrap this up for you. Uh, I collected a few resources, so hopefully these slides are going to be shared with you. Um, mscripton, that's the you know, C, C++ uh, to WebAssembly compiler. Uh, MDN has very good resources on WebAssembly. Uh, I also, also put up a sample repository that you can take a look at with these examples. There's also this website called WebAssembly by example, so you see various WebAssembly examples. Um, Scrooge.app is a really, really great application by, by Google. They also have a case study, like how they managed to uh, create an application using WebAssembly that is much faster than just doing the same stuff with JavaScript. And Scrooge.app is also very special because, and here's something that you can think about as well, since WebAssembly is just another file that you load in the browser, think about progressive web applications and what you can do with WebAssembly. Progressive web applications means that you can specify resources that you want to uh, be available, you want to make available offline. A WebAssembly module is just another file that you can tell the progressive web app to work with offline. So that leaves you with a with a lot of opportunities there. And Scrooge.app is in fact also a progressive web app that caches WebAssembly, uh, the underlying WebAssembly module that they use. And if you want to have fun, someone ported Doom 3 into WebAssembly so that it's playable within the browser. So have a look at that as well. And with that, thank you very much for, for your attention. Um, I hope you, you managed to learn something or, you, or I managed to you know, make you curious about WebAssembly. And as I said, if you have any questions about what I talked about, um, feel free to, to contact me on, on Twitter and I'll be more be happy to to you know talk to you and, and answer your questions.